Yeah, okay. So I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to the seminar, Water Resource Science Seminar today. Today we're going to hear uh, about the geolo geologic atlas uh, uh, resource that uh, is uh, part of the effort by the Minnesota Geological Survey to uh, document what our geology looks like across the state. Um, it's a tremendous resource to be able to go and uh, look at information that's available in the uh, databases that the Geological Survey has. And I have some experience, recent experience, where I've been using geological atlases for some groundwater work. And I find it to be um, tremendous. I'm working with uh, 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 Tony Runkle, and uh, I'm very thankful to Julia Steinberg, who's uh, provided me with uh, information from the geological atlases. But today, what we're going to hear is going to hear from, uh, we have uh, two speakers that are going to make a presentation about the geologic atlas uh, program and the database. And the first one is going to be Barbara Lasardi. Uh, she's with the Minnesota Geological Survey. And then uh, we, we're going to hear from, uh, following that, we're going to hear from Paul Poussier. He's going to speak about the, or he's with the Minnesota Na, uh, Department of Natural Resources in the groundwater, uh, in the water resources area, but especially in the groundwater. So um, look forward to, to hearing your presentation and uh, I'll uh, end there. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, John. Well, thank you for having us. And Paul, again, I apologize that I didn't include your name on my title slide and I didn't realize it until just when we started this slideshow up. But uh, again, my name is Barbara Lusardi. I am the Associate Director of the Minnesota Geological Survey. And uh, what you might not know is that the County Geologic Atlas Program is nearly 40 years old. It comes in two parts. There's a part A, which is the geology framework, and there is a part B, which is the groundwater atlas, and that's what Paul is going to talk about. Um, so there's two parts and one atlas. And we tend to uh, focus on the fact that atlases are good for managing water resources, but in truth, um, the geologic framework is useful for all sorts of issues and questions. Yes, you can identify water resources, you can protect uh, recreational water resources, but you can also um, site areas of mineral resources or aggregate for building. You can use this information to uh, site pipelines and underground utilities. And I recently gave a presentation to a group of has, hazmat responders. So who knew that uh, our information was out there and being used by so many um, different and varied organizations and people. We make maps. Um, now, I imagine that uh, most young people aren't familiar with paper maps anymore because, at least road maps, everything is on Google on your phone. But this is a, a screenshot of the city map for Minneapolis and St. Paul. And here you can see the roads, you can see the airport, and the colored shaded areas outline all of the different suburbs. Well, a geologic map of the same area is not that much different. You can see the roads. Instead of the airports, we'll show you where there are gravel pits located. And the shaded colored areas actually show you the distribution of different geologic materials. Is it sand? Is it rock? Is it clay? And you might ask, why is this important? Um, what difference does it make? Well, the distribution of these materials can vary widely and it can affect the, the materials that fall on it. Anything that falls from the sky or from a pipeline or from a tanker truck is going to fall onto this geology, into this framework. The geology is essentially the container for any of these materials. And the more we understand that container and how it filters material, the better decisions that we can make. So for example, if you have a rainwater that's falling down over a pink sandy soil like shown here, it's going to sink in very quickly, like on a beach. And if you have a thick underlying sand, that water could potentially flow very quickly underneath the land surface to a place that's further away that you're not even aware of. And again, that has uh, various implications for hazardous materials, 
or groundwater contamination. Conversely, if you have rainwater that's falling on clay rich soils, like this image shows, it's going to stay on the top. It can't filter through that material very easily. And so that's going to run over land and flood or pond in areas, which presents its own issues. We make maps. We make a lot of maps. Uh, part A of the County Geologic Atlas um, typically contains anywhere from five to seven different map plates. And here is a list of those map plates. We start with the database so that you can see what materials, what information we used to create our interpretations and our maps. Then we map the bedrock geology, which is the bottom of the, the surfaces that we can actually show. And we map the surface geology. And of course, then we can map everything in between. And I'll explain some of these different materials as we go through this presentation. We make a lot of maps. As I said, each, each county geologic atlas will have about five different plates in it. And we are planning an atlas for all 87 counties in Minnesota. So that's a lot of maps. We currently have 43 counties completed, and that includes um, several counties that we have actually redone. We've done them a second time because early in the program, um, our maps weren't so technologically savvy. We, they weren't digital. And so in areas where there is high demand and a great need, we will actually uh, redo the Atlas and uh, bring it up to date, up to speed with all of our current products and technology. Uh, we have 21 counties that are not even started yet. Um, but we anticipate at our current pace and funding that we will have the 87th county in production within the next decade. Here's an example of one of our plates. These are PDFs, um, but we do print them on paper. So they're, I don't know, two feet by three feet, very large. We fold them up so that it's handy to pull them out when you're in the car. Um, this is an example of the surficial geology plate for Wadena County. And if you're familiar with looking at maps, you'll see that only about half of this sheet of paper is actually the map. So here's the map and all of the elements that you would find on a map, the scale, the location diagram, the description of map units. The rest of this material is supplemental information, regional geology, uh, glacial history of the area, um, tables that show if different textures and data. And so all of this supplemental information, we hope the user will find helpful. Of course, it's a work of art. It's uh, spectacular. And we hope again, that the user finds this uh, helpful. But what if you really just want to answer a simple question? Do you really need all of this detail, all of the line symbols and all of the different shaded patterns and all of the text when you wanna know, is it sand or is it not? And so part of our um, program is that we can provide these maps in a digital format in a GIS environment so that you can bring this data into your own project if you're citing that pipeline or looking for um, areas where there's sand and gravel within a distance that you can mine. And then you can um, take our information and recode it based on the attribute tables of that map so that you can, be, you can get a much simpler version if that's all you need to answer your question. Here's another example. This is our bedrock plate for Sherburne County. And again, a lot of information. Um, maybe you just can't digest all that information. Maybe all you need is to see the bedrock Precambrian crystalline bedrock and you can blank out the rest of the rocks that are in this area that's not of use to you. Conversely, you can just pull out the Paleozoic rocks. So it's very handy to have digital information in a format that you can use to answer the questions that you have. We also include lots and lots of data. Again, part of our database plate shows that information on a map view, but we include all of the data tables this is an example of some of the data that we have for the state of Minnesota. Our county well index is got over 500,000 water well records for the state. And water well records are kind of iffy. It depends, some of them are really good and some of them are less than helpful. But the sheer volume of uh, records in this database makes it uh, invaluable um, as a starting point for our geology. 
We also have a database that we have created over the last couple of decades, which houses our glacial sediment information. So anything that we pick up on our own out of a gravel pit or using our uh, Giddings trucks, um, all of our laboratory analyses for our glacial sediments are in what we call the Quaternary Data Index. We also use geophysics. This is a way that we can um, get a view of the bedrock even if the glacial sediments are quite thick. And so we have aeromagnetics and gravity anomalies. We use passive seismic to get uh, information on the depth. How thick is that glacial sediment over the bedrock? And we also have so many other tools in our toolbox. We have an in-house lab where we can measure the texture of glacial sediments. We actually count sand grains to help us identify um, where the glaciers came from. We have our own drilling rig. It's on a pickup truck. It's called a Giddings probe. We can drill about 15 feet legally with this apparatus, which is very handy. Um, but for deeper sediments, we want to contract with uh, a drilling company. This, we use a technique called rotary sonic drilling. This provides us a continuous four inch diameter core of sediment from the surface all the way down to the bedrock. And here's an example of the log of one of those cores. And so to be able to, to see the sequence of all of those glacial units all the way down to the bedrock at the bottom is uh, spectacular. We use that information to create our cross sections. As much as we like making maps, we like cross sections just as much. If you're not familiar with a cross section, imagine you're looking at a road cut or a, a gravel pit, some exposure maybe in your backyard, except that instead of just 20 feet of material, here you've got maybe 600 feet of material. This uh, top line is the ground surface. The bedrock surface is the, the bottom line where the white starts here. And all of these black sticks are water wells. This is the information that we use to help identify all of these different layers. And we use those rotary sonic cores as our golden spikes to help identify um, trends that we see in this information. And here's just an example of how many cross sections we'll do for just one small county. We actually will draw a cross section like this every kilometer throughout the county, north to south. And we do that because that level of detail allows us to string information together. We can pull out, um, excuse me, somebody's knocking on my door. Mark, we're expecting a package. That's the hazards of working from home. Um, we string this information together and actually create surfaces of each of these layers so we can visualize this in three dimensions. What we're really looking for is these uh, buried sand and gravel bodies that are uh, potential aquifers. And in this center diagram, you can see this is the, the LIDAR DEM of the land surface. This uh, muted color at the bottom is the bedrock topography, so the bedrock surface. And then you can see these different colored um, areas in between. Those are those sand bodies that we're identifying and we can map those out for an entire county. Of course, we're still printing these on a piece of paper. So from 3D, we have to go back to 2D. And so we can display this information on a, on a paper plate using color to indicate how deep the sand is and using contours to indicate how thick it might be. And so this is what we call our sand distribution model. And these are all of the different glacial till layers as you go deeper and deeper down to the bedrock surface. And these are the sand bodies that are associated with those till layers. And so a map like this or data like this, it's most useful in a digital form because you can stack all these up. And if you're a municipality, a township that needs a new water well, um, you can find out, okay, we can drill here or here. And the map can indicate, okay, maybe you'll get five sands if you drill in this location. In the other spot, you might only hit two. And so you have to weigh your options. Where can you best spend your money if you're going to get more chances of getting water in one location versus another? 
the DNR is our biggest user of our cross sections. And I apologize, this isn't the same, but you get the idea. We do the geology cross sections here. And Paul will talk about what the DNR does with this information. They're going to add value to it. They're going to do water chemistry and age and be able to tell you how these different um, sand and gravel bodies are interconnected and how the water flows through this container. I'm gonna pass it over to Paul pretty quickly here, but I just wanted to let you know where you can find our information. If you Google the Minnesota Geological Survey, click on our page of data and mapping programs and you'll come to our County Geologic Atlas page. We have a Geologic Atlas user's guide that is in depth, shows all of the different plates, what information they contain and how that information can be used to answer various different problems. We have links to each of the different county atlases where you can download the GIS data and again, put it into your own presentation or your own um, project files. You can also download the PDFs of each plate. So the, the paper maps, but you can see them on your screen. Of course, they're huge. So you have to zoom in and scroll around. It's not super handy. And something that we've gotten into recently is what we call story maps. This is a way that you can access all of the geologic atlas information from your browser. You don't need any special software, no site licenses. It's not quite as, um, Nimble, you can't do everything that you would be able to in ArcMap, but in some cases you can do enough. So across the top of this page, you can see the different counties for which we have um, story maps. And then you can see all of those different plates, the database plate, the bedrock plate. And just like in GIS, you can turn on and off layers. You can turn on and off symbols. You can recode the information so that it's as simple or as complicated as you need it to be. And here's where I'll turn it over to Paul. He's got a similar website where you can access their information and I will stop sharing. Thanks Barb. Am I on? I don't. Can, can you hear me? I can hear you, but I don't right. see your slides yet. Oh, I haven't started that part of it yet. So let's, let's see what we can do here. So curious about all of you out there and internet world and what you're studying and what kind of projects you're working on, but I guess we won't have time today. Um, can you see the cover slide? Just give me some feedback on that. Just the two people sampling at a well. Got it. Yes. Yep. Got it, of course. And Barb, you were so fast. I probably could have slipped in a couple more slides today, but uh, we'll move from here. Um, <clears throat> Oh, I see, let me see here. The uh, view is covering up my notes. I wonder how we get rid of that. Let's see. You'll just have to wait. Let's it. try that, that works. So uh, uh, I'm gonna pick up where Barb left off with uh, Geologic Atlas Complete for a County, uh, the Minnesota Geological Survey, Barb's crew, hands us all of that wonderful raw data well, it's not raw data, but they give us the raw data. And uh, then we begin to prepare a groundwater atlas for the same county. So we kind of follow behind them as we go. And as Barb mentioned, um, let me see here, it's not forwarding for some reason. There we go. Um, we call it the county atlas series. Uh, there's the, the geology is often referred to as A, the groundwater as B. So two parts, one atlas for a county. Uh, I'm going to cover just some of the basics of the products that we have and take a little detour just because it's Friday and you guys need a little detour today. It's so beautiful out. So uh, what is the atlas? Well, we'd like to call it information infrastructure. It uh, does not do a lot of uh, final analysis for people, but if you're a, someone like uh, Professor Niebuhr working out there, it is the kind of stuff you go to to start a lot of your work. Um, the atlas is a, the groundwater atlas is a detailed uh, evaluation of a groundwater resources in a county and included to that is things that you would expect the GIS data. We're often asked to gather up the chemistry data 
and supply it to researchers uh, and other people that use that type of information. Um, groundwater flow, a big part of our, of our product is the pollution sensitivity, which is used widely of key aquifers. And we also do uh, cross sections with key characteristics that really give people a sense of what's going on. Barb showed one just in passing there, so. But who uses it? This has become uh, really an interesting question that we ask, especially because we go to the state for a lot of our funding and a lot of times they wanna know. So we've been talking, Barb and I, with a lot of people around the state and this is kind of the list. There's probably others, but county staff, business, industry, ag, engineering consultants, communities, SWCDs, private citizens, uh, agencies, USGS is always calling us for data, researchers and educators. So uh, it covers a pretty broad range of users. And uh, we've been collecting testimonials from people on specific end uses of the Atlas over the last few years. And it's quite interesting. And many times we find very creative uses for the data that we've gathered into this, this uh, resource. So let's go on. Um, when an Atlas is complete, we begin the education process with workshops hosted by the county and for interested stakeholders in the county. Um, we use real life groundwater problems and walk through how the Atlas can be used to resolve those problems. Like if you're trying to site a business that needs a lot of water or you're trying to site a solid waste landfill or something like that. Uh, this is a photo from the Washington County workshop uh, just a couple of years ago. So at this point, I just wanna take a brief side trip uh, from water science to water politics, everybody's probably very tired of politics, but just for fun. Um, for me, after working 25 years in groundwater science, I encountered the collision of uh, science and politics when I became embroiled in a local water resource challenge that's called White Bear Lake. So I can't go into the details on that project today as much as I'd love to. But one thing that I learned uh, is that when you move from science to the realm of politics, you discover that there's always villains and heroes. And working for the DNR, I found that I was often both. So I also love movies about dystopian futures because they often revolve around the politics of water and or oil, both important to geologists, villains and heroes. And they often point to underlying truths that we're encountering in our own day and age. So. Uh, your assignment is to uh, find some of these movies, be energized by them in the coming weeks and months. Uh, one of my most recent favorites is Mad Max Fury Road. I don't know if anybody else has seen that. Um, so sometimes I thought as I was working on uh, some of these projects that with a more political twist that I was Immortan Joe from the movie who famously says, do not become addicted to water it will take hold of you, you will resent its absence, which is so true. And sometimes I was Mad Max and Furiosa who throughout the movie were taking us all to the green place where water was plentiful. So I'm hope this is gonna work. I have a very short cut from the film that I think says it all. Uh, you may wanna turn your volume up just a little bit Fingers crossed here. I think we'll, we'll see if it works. I'm not sure if I'll be able to tell if anybody's listen, hearing it, but here we go. It is by my hand you will rise from the ashes of this world. This is somebody who will chop heads for not accepting that he was a god. I am your redeemer. He controlled the one essential wealth of the water, and that gave him his power. I hope you guys could hear that. Can someone turn their mic off and tell me if the sound came through? Came yes, through. it did. So he controlled the one essential wealth, the water, and that gave him his power. So with wealth, power, no wonder that we always run into villains and heroes and politics. Sorry about that little sidetrack, but I had to do something fun today. Um, so I'm going to walk through a couple of the end products, just a taste of what's in the DNR's groundwater atlas. Of course, water table plays an important role in our analysis. On the left, this is Washington County, 
is the water table elevation. So again, this is uh, this is uh, elevation from sea level. So the blue colors low, the high colors, the warm colors high. So you can kind of see this natural divide down through the middle of Washington County. Uh, another set of data that we produce is called depth to water. So from the land surface, uh, and this map uh, represents that. And these are the cross sections that we produce in the atlas as well. And there's sections in between also. Um, Washington County used this product quite extensively to develop a risk model that they apply to land use, especially to evaluate the risk of private septic systems, which they have many of. And so they've developed a whole process that's based on partly on this type of analysis that they were waiting for us to get out to them. So just one of the many uses. We also collect samples uh, from about 100 locations in each county and analyze them for a relatively broad set of constituents. Uh, all of these are available to you and we can package them up and send them out for the different counties pretty readily. And we're doing that quite frequently. Uh, this is includes uh, chemicals that we sometimes think of as having human impact, chlorides, bromides, nitrates, but also naturally occurring health concerns, arsenic, manganese, boron. We found a lot in a couple of counties, which surprised us. Additional uh, cations, anions, we do uh, some analysis for stable isotopes, which give us some indication of the groundwater surface water connection. Uh, we also sample for tritium and carbon-14 to get some relative age ideas. Uh, this is really important for us because we use it to check against our pollution sensitivity model to see that it makes sense. If we have an area that's a very low pollution sensitivity, in other words, it would take a long time for water from the surface to reach it, but it has a relatively young tritium age, we have to say what's going on and reevaluate that model for that uh, county. We also use data from Department of Health, Ag, PCA, and the University of Minnesota, and any place else we can gather it together. So just one example is the analysis of stable isotopes. Many of you are familiar with this. Uh, there's a water has a different isotopic signature if precipitation directly recharges the groundwater or uh, conversely, if it resides in a lake or some other surface water body for some time before recharging the groundwater. So if it goes through a lake, it will have an evaporative signature, is what we call it. So the result of the stable isotope analysis gives us clues to the water history and the connection of the surface water to the groundwater. On the lower diagram, uh, the, the open squares to the left, these represent uh, groundwater that probably infiltrated directly into the soil system uh, after it was came out of the sky. And over at this end, the red boxes are what we call evaporative signatures. So those are from wells and also lakes and so forth uh, that so that they had been at the surface for some time in the lake and that provides some useful information for us. Just an example. And one of the key things, one of the things that Barb touched on is the, the cross section. This again is Washington County, Oakdale to, to the St. Croix. A Couple of things to look at. There's a lot in here. And of course it's all resides in a data set in our GS files as well, which are available to everybody. This black line separates the uh, bedrock aquifers from the quaternary aquifers, quaternary aquifers. Um, you can see the layer cake of East Metro that we're all pretty familiar with if we work in this environment. Um, another thing to see immediately is the three primary colors of red, green, and blue. And those are indicative of the tritium uh, results that we got. Red being mo more recent tritium concentrations, green being a mixed, and uh, blue being pre-modern tritium values as we uh, evaluate them. So you can immediately kind of get a sense for what's going on in, in the, the uh, cross section, in the, the groundwater. Now, 
one of the things in Washington County uh, that's become very important is this uh, buried bedrock valley, which of course is mapped by the survey, but then becomes a, an important groundwater feature because this provides a direct conduit of water from the surface into the deeper aquifers, which are highly used by Woodbury, Cottage Grove, and all those cities out in the East Metro. So it becomes a, a dynamic conduit to contamination which is in fact what took place out here. We also see that in Washington County, uh, unfortunately also has this uh, groundwater divide right down the middle with water in the west exiting at the Mississippi and water in the east he heading towards the St. Croix, which created a lot of distribution of uh, industrial contaminants that ended up out in the Woodbury and Oakdale area. You also see the black arrows, those are very general uh, flow direction arrows. And then for each well that we sample, uh, we will provide some of the chemistry in the cross section as well. In this case, 325 parts per million chloride, uh, one part per million nitrate. We see that it's got a, a red E. That means that it has an evaporative signature. Not really surprising since it's just below Lake Elmo. And the three is uh, tells us it tells the user where we think the water is coming from. In this case. It's uh, coming from uh, uh, an aquifer system above it. Whereas over here, you have an L that's a lateral flow while you're getting some of the results that you're getting. So there's a lot more in the cross sections, but that's just sort of the highlights. Uh, here's a cross section from Clay County, which we finished a couple of years ago. Clay is very well known for its thick sequence of, of clays. One thing I didn't mention is that where a formation is not colored green, pink, or blue, it's either a gray or a dark gray or a light gray. These are the aquitards, the tills, the clays, and the darker the, the uh, shade, the, more, uh, the less permeable it is. Um, so you can see that they have kind of a lack of really resources compared to the East Metro in terms of water. This is a very famous aquifer, the Buffalo Aquifer, been well studied over the years. So you have the same thing going on, young water, pink, old water, blue. You have carbon-14 analysis, 30,000 years. Uh, this is very uh, interesting to the general public when we talk about the ages of the groundwater and really gives them a sense about why this resource is kind of mysterious, important, and why it's important to manage it now because it takes a long time for some of these systems to set up. Um, in this case, we also have some of the problematic issues of arsenic. Uh, the health department is saying that if you have a well with any measurable arsenic, it is a health problem nowadays. So 55 and 24, not uncommon for parts of Minnesota and a real issue for people. Pollution sensitivity is one of the key uh, products that we have and we divide it into two methods. First, we call it the near surface materials. That's basically the water table. And it's a combination of uh, the surface soils and the upper geologic materials. And we do an evaluation uh, based on the, the common permeabilities and say, how long will it take for water hitting the land surface to make it to the water table or 10 feet below the land surface? And then the second one is the buried aquifers in the top of the bedrock. We do a GIS analysis. This is kind of a simplistic view of it, but you can see over here we have, uh, it says uh, very low. So that's very low pollution sensitivity because there's 41 feet of clay, let's say, on top of it. Whereas this has a very high pollution sensitivity because it's covered directly above by surficial sands, a very small thickness of, of, of fine grain material. And so that's why it gets a very high. We just kind of go from low to medium to high to very high and, and we have very low. So that's one of the key outputs. In plan view, this is what it's gonna look like for Washington County. And we have one of these type of maps for each one of the key aquifers. I can't remember how many we mapped in Washington County, but there, there are often a dozen. The shallow aquifer, here's the pollution sensitivity. And this aquifer does not exist anywhere in the county except where you see the colors. So it also shows you a nice distribution of where some of these aquifers exist. In this case, the hot colors are high sensitivity, the greens are low sensitivity. Then we move a little farther down. I don't remember how deep this aquifer is, but it goes from the 
top of the county to the south of the county. You can see that it changes in its sensitivity to pollution uh, from the greens in the north to the hot colors in the south. And then the top of bedrock, we know that parts of Washington County are karst in the sense that there's less than 50 feet of overburden protecting the aquifers or the bedrock, the bedrock aquifers. So that's why you have all this red, especially in the southern and eastern side of the top of the bedrock surface. If you remember, this surface is that black line in the cross section I showed you. Hope I'm not going too fast. Um, this is uh, just a picture from a field trip we did in Washington County. This is a Prairie du Chien quarry in Bayport and always a great interest to people when you say the Prairie du Chien being one of the workhorse aquifers for the Metro and here it's completely dry. And that's because of the structure of these, these uh, uh, formations as they head east. And uh, so a beautiful place to look at what the aquifer looks like uh, and it's, I think it's always stunning to people who aren't that familiar with it to see that this rock is where we're getting all our gazillion gallons, gallons of water each year. And finally, we also have a user's guide, which is a, a simple reference identifying uh, how to use the atlas, key terms, and techniques. And finally, uh, again, a, a field trip. Washington County was a great county to do this work. There's so many interesting geologic features. This is Ferry Falls just north of Stillwater. If you haven't been there, it's a pretty walk. Just don't do it in July. The bugs will kill you. So thank you very much, John and Dan and students. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Let Those, me stop uh, sharing here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Barb and Paul, for your presentation. So now I'd like to open it up for questions. I guess this isn't super related, but do you know what deformation event caused all that folding you showed in the cross section for Washington County? Uh, Barb can probably answer that best. The folding, <laughs> the faulting in Washington County. I didn't really mention the faulting out there, but there is also a lot of faulting that took place besides the whole basin effect. Unfortunately, I'm a glacial geologist and I didn't work in Washington County, so uh, I can't really answer that very well. You'll have to look it up in the Washington County Atlas. Okay, thank you. It's yeah, available I mean, these, online. Yeah, the formations were, were laid down, you know, uh, 500 million years ago, many of those aspects of it, and they've been subjected to a lot of earth movement, large earth movement since that time. Um, and so that's that's why we have what's called the Twin Cities Basin, and I don't remember the exact uh, events that created that bar, but uh, th there's a big bowl in the Twin Cities, and that is fortunate for us because they are very productive and uh, wonderful aquifers for us where we have most of the, the population of Minnesota. But even these aquifers have a, have a finite limit on what they can produce, so. And they're relatively shallow in the Twin Cities area because the glacial material is, uh, it's variable, but it can be quite shallow. Thank you. I have a question about the stable isotopes that uh, plot that you had with the evaporative versus meteoric water. The axes labels on that were missing. Was that deuterium and... Um, the, the oxygen isotopes on the, uh, on the X axis and the hydrogen isotopes on the Y axis, I believe. Okay, that makes sense. I knew someone would ask me that. I'm not a chemistry guy and <laughs> I picked the most difficult part of all of our chemistry to put there today, but uh, yeah, that's a great question. And um, yeah. Do you also measure uh, carbon 13 and 14? Yep. Well, you carbon 14, Carbon-14 is, is what we report, but I believe that the lab, uh, we use uh, uh, Waterloo, the University of Waterloo in Ontario for our carbon analysis, and um, they do a C13, and I'm not exactly sure why. It's part of the process to give us the C14. It's a little bit of black magic, the whole carbon-14 and water thing, I have to admit, but uh, it does usually make sense. It's sometimes you just scratch your head and go, I don't really know how that can be 5,000 year old water, you know, but. Black magic sounds about right. Yeah, it's a little bit like that. Thank you.
but it's good enough that we continue to use it. And we keep, we keep coming back to that, you know, because we don't want to put it in our atlas if we can't hang our hats on it. And talking to the, uh, the, the people that are in the know on this, we feel comfortable with the ranges. So it's a plus or minus, obviously 30,000, it's a plus or minus five to 7,000 years kind of a thing. But I think it's very helpful when I tell my neighbor and he's watering his lawn every day of the summer, I say, you know, that water down here in Burnsville is about a thousand to 3000 years old, you know, take it a little easy, buddy. But yeah, I think that's an interesting point because you, you imagine people don't recognize how long, you know, if the water is that old, that means it's been there that long. And how long will it take to replenish that once it's gone? Yeah, it was going to be something I was going to ask about the 30,000 year old water. Um, would that be recommended to be pumping it? Uh, because, I mean, it may be that it's somehow close, you would think it's probably closed off or it's just not part of the overall flow pattern for groundwater in the area. And so then maybe by starting to pump it, you suddenly make it so that water will return to it, you know, from somewhere, you know, within the flow system but i don't know if that's the case or not well it is definitely the case and you, I, I don't have the cross section up but these are very discrete sand bodies in the middle of very dense clay and uh, the reason we have the thirty thousand number is because we got it from a well so somebody's using mm -hmm. that water yeah. you mm -hmm. know if they were smart they'd they'd make it into beer and 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 hype it up somehow you know thirty thousand year old water although old water is not always better water you know you just have right. to say yeah, but yeah. uh so but they're not pumping it hard you know uh and and it is surrounded by saturated clays and they are providing some water movement to it but the buffalo aquifer of course in moorhead was was pumped almost to extinction uh for many years until they finally realized that they just couldn't couldn't meet the needs of the cities in that area and they moved to the red river where they pump about mm, maybe 90 percent of their water now and they use the the buffalo aquifer uh, which again is a discrete uh, linear sand body and it it was it was getting drained pretty quickly mm. so it's it's recharged since they moved to the uh, red river it's kind of an interesting story okay i had a question for uh barb you showed some maps with data for well logs and other information that you used to make the county atlases, the geologic maps. And there was very little data in the south, in Martin and Free uh, Faribault counties, for example, where, which are areas you don't have any maps right now. Um, how do you plan to go about mapping the geology in those areas? I imagine there are plenty of water wells in those areas. Perhaps one of the maps you were indicating the data sources was our quaternary data index. And those um, data points get uh, populated when we go down there and we uh, drive around and we look for road cuts and we look for gravel pits and we uh, you know, look in gopher holes and fence posts and we use our Giddings truck along the side of the road and so we will actually be collecting those samples and populating that data table. We will also, I've got the sun in here. I'm not usually at work this late in the day. <laughs> um, uh, we will be collecting information for new counties. We don't necessarily um, collect all that information ahead of time, but we'll be looking for exploration holes. We'll be looking for uh, Army Corps of Engineers, Highway Department, anything that the USGS might have drilled in a particular area. So a lot of the database for a county um, gets compiled once the county atlas begins. So we haven't worked in, uh, in some of those counties yet, so we haven't started collecting the data. But you're, you're, on, to, you're on to a challenge that we have, Dan. Uh, you're on to a big challenge. We just finished uh, sampling in Rock and Nobles County, which are the extreme Southwest part of the state. And uh, many of those communities and individuals are going to regional water systems. And there just are not as many wells because there's not as many people. Uh, you know, Hennepin County, you know, gazillion wells. And um, when um, Anoka, 
Washington, all these, but as soon as we start getting out farther, it becomes, I think, more of a, well, it becomes a challenge for Barb's group too, but especially mm -hmm. for us when we're trying to find wells to sample, it's hard to find a hundred wells in some of these counties. We'll be moving into the Northeast where Barb's crew is just finishing up St. Louis Cook and Lake. And again, it's a whole different environment. I mean, we're good at Anoka County. We're good at Washington County, you know, the large sand bodies, lots of wells, the Paleozoic, lots of wells, but we're gonna have to look at our processes when we move into some of these other parts of the state. You do have to be able to adapt to the different environments. You know, in some counties, we don't do cross sections because the glacial sediment isn't thick enough and it doesn't, it doesn't, we can't show anything basically. Or there was something else I was gonna say and it just flew out of my head. I've lost it now, <laughs> it's late on a Friday. <laughs> there was some point to that discussion. Well, I, I have a question for Barb. Uh, you, know, you, you were indicating there's 500,000 wells uh, and you, know, you have a range of quality of the data that's in the well logs. It's nice that those are all digital because I remember when I first came to Minnesota, if you wanted to look at a well log, you had to go to the uh, MGS office over there on University Avenue and open up a filing cabinet. You had a key to it and you pulled out a piece of paper that had the well log. We and still now, have all those pieces of paper. Well, that's good. <laughs> it's <laughs> a, a huge, it is a huge undertaking. It is the, the database is now, um, kind of overseen by the Department of Health. Um, we created it and we still populated all of the water wells for the state. The well drillers are required to submit a well log to the health department and then the health department farms those over to us and we enter those data into the CWI database. And some of them are as simple as zero to 400 feet drift. That's, that's the detail you get. Those are the not so good wells. And others are, you know, zero to 10 feet. And it'll tell you exactly what different units and how thick they are all the way down to bedrock. And so, again, you can live with some that are not so good to get the ones that are fabulous. Oh, and that's a resource oh that is continually being updated. And so we are working on ways to, to incorporate new water wells into previous mapping. How do we how do we keep mapping and improving our products um, without getting caught into the legislature's uh, um, fun weariness of, you know, aren't you finished yet? You've already mapped everything, but it's important that we continue to map and that we interpret, change our interpretations. And so we are working on ways to um, bring those water well data and new data into our mapping and be able to update portions of it. Maybe that'll be the next um, mapping program after the atlases are done. We'll have a way to, you know, hit targeted areas and provide new mapping for a specific purpose or specific region. I was going to ask so, uh, about the quality of the data in the CWI. Is it the older wells that you don't have as good a quality data, but, or is it even today you would get a very indescribed, poorly described well log? It, it depends on the well driller. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's a requirement. I don't think the well drillers get paid anymore to uh, submit this information. And yeah. so mm -hmm. some are more dedicated than others. Certainly some of the old ones are fabulous and certainly some of the new ones are less than fabulous. But when you've got 500,000 to choose from, it, uh, like you said, you can overlook it. Paul mentioned the, the, the sheer data density in the Twin Cities Metro. I mentioned that uh, most of our counties, we do our cross sections, one kilometer spacing. And much of that is dependent on the water wells because that's the, the bulk of the data we use to delineate those units. When we did Anoka County, we had to double that. We did cross sections every half a kilometer because there were so many water wells. You couldn't see them when you brought them up on your screen. Hmm. So it's a, it's a curse in some cases. But what kind of effect does that have on the accuracy of your mapping? So for example, if you took Anoka County and you threw out half of your data, would you get the same map that you had when you use all of the data? 
I think it would be very similar. We have a, a, a Minnesota at a glance, it's a fact sheet on our website that, uh, just, uh, that shows the difference between an old map and a new map. And the old map isn't wrong, it's just not as detailed. And so when you are able to add in more data, you can flesh out some of the, the little details that you wouldn't be able to find. Um, of course, we wanna keep as much data as possible. So that's why we were able to, to say, okay, let's do every half a kilometer so that we can use all this information and not miss out. That's why we hope in you know some place like the Southwest, we're not likely to go back and redo a county atlas there. But you know if they're going to get another hundred wells someday, maybe <laughs> if they can find the water, it would be nice to be able to incorporate that information into our mapping and to be able to revise our um, you know our line work to match those data. The, uh... Yeah, I, I was just going to ask a question about the uh, time to start to finish on a county. So one of those 21 that you said that hasn't been started yet, uh, and they might get started by the end of the decade or something like that. Um, how long would it be from start to finish? For part A, we estimate anywhere from three to five years. So, you know, give or take maybe four years. It certainly depends on the location. Something like uh, St. Louis County is uh, was a special circumstance because it's so big and it's so far away and it's so difficult to access. But uh, a typical county like uh, Dodge County in the Southeast uh, Minnesota would take four years from start to finish. And then we hand it over to Paul and he takes how long, Paul? Let's say three, three years. Mm -hmm. It's a of long process. It's Paul's information they want. <laughs> we, we tell That's them not true. <laughs> we all know the part A is the best part, but, um, and that's why, you know, from a political standpoint, it's hard to keep going back. There's a lot of funding fatigue, like you guys know in the academic world. And so, we're trying to uh, mine how people are using the Atlas because we get asked that, Barb and I get asked that by the people we keep going to with our hat in hand and saying, you know, we've only got uh, 30 more counties and they're like, oh, we're, you've been doing this for 30 years, you know, <laughs> can't you finish up? But uh, Aren't so you done yet? if you have, John, if you or anyone else has any thing that you've used them for in your research and so forth, um, I'd be happy to send you kind of some of the examples of what we've used from other people, but just even a short paragraph is sometimes all that we need, you know, uh, if you're interested, we'd love to see those. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to provide. I'll reach out to you about that another time. Well, we, we had a bedrock, or a, you know, a buried valley in uh, bedrock valley in uh, uh, Meha Creek. Oh. That, that one along the chain of lakes there, and it had a big effect on the what the flow in the creek is. Um, and we use stable isotopes and so on to quantify. Interesting. Of, yeah. So uh, we just published a paper on it. So I'll give it, I'll send it out to you. Yeah, that'd be great. A lot going on over in that neighborhood too. Yeah. We talk about politics and policy right. and yeah. science all meshing together. Other questions? not uh, want to thank both of you. I do want to thank Paul for uh, giving me a new movie to watch because I did like the <laughs> Mad Max movies, the old ones, and I knew this new one had come out, but I never watched it. And because it's about water, I guess I'm going to have to. Maybe I'll use it in my class. Yeah, and, and the other the other good one, of course, is Tank Girl, if you haven't seen that one. that That's pretty quirky, but that is a great futuristic. It's, it's called Tank Girl, T -A -N -K literally like an army tank girl. So it, it comes on TV every once in a while. It's out there, but it's a big, it's a big water, water battle movie. 